all right so the welcome to the uh, uh, experience to evidence uh, 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 webinar or a part of the IOC. First of all, I thank IOC and INTAS for this uh, particular uh, session that we are going to have. And as we know, the biosimilars have here to stay and they have given a big amount of difference in management of uh, patients with DME and age-related ma uh, macular uh, degenerations in our patients. They have helped us a lot bringing down the cost of treatment for the patients using the same molecule. And this particular uh, session is to take us through those particular experiences that we have. The first uh, speaker that we have is Dr. Soman Mondul from Kolkata. Uh, Soman, can you please load up your first slide itself? Yeah, sure. Am I visible and audible? Yes. yes. So Soamin is uh, going to take us through the safety outcomes of intravitreal, uh, intravitreal ranuzuma biosimilar. So as you know, in the beginning, people had a lot of doubts about the safety of the biosimilar of ranuzumab. And over a period of time, it has proven itself to be as safe as anything that we have experienced in a treatment of anti -VEGFs. So Soman uh, is a senior vitrodotonal consultant from Dishai Hospitals, Calcutta. And Soman, can you please uh, go ahead with your talk? Thank you, Dr. Nishikant. Uh, and I'd also like to thank AIOC for giving me this opportunity to present our paper here. Uh, we, as we all know, AMD, DME, and RVO are the leading causes of uh, visual imp impairment right now. By 2040, we, uh, we will have approximately 288 million people suffering from age-related macular degeneration and uh, 642 million people would be suffering from uh, diabetes mellitus. The management of uh, visual impairment due to neovascular AMD, DME, and RVO has been revolutionized by anti vegf therapy. As we all know, since 2004 till date, we have uh, we had had pegaptinib, bevacizumab, ranibizumab, aflivacept, and now we have brolicizumab since 2019. Now, to optimally treat retinal disorders, these drugs must be injected repeatedly over many years. Therefore, the high cost might be prohibitive for many. This underscores the need of a widely available, yet economical and effective, and above all, safe anti of drug. Now, bevacizumab meets most of the criteria, but it's off-level. So here comes our own uh, biosimilar that is Razumab. It's uh, uh, developed, it's the first biosimilar that had got approved by the DCGI in 2015. And a uh, limited number of patients were treated uh, in a controlled environment in the phase three studies. Now, then we had re-enact trial, which failed to identify any new safety concerns with Razumab. But yet, as Dr. Borse had mentioned in his introduction, there have been sporadic cases of sterile and ophthalmitis in uh, early production batches, which forced the developer to modify the uh, manufacturing process. And then subsequently, we hadn't faced any sterile and ophthalmitis cases since January 2019. Now, data from reenact suggests that Razumab is safe, but there were relatively uh, the relatively small number of uh, treated eyes may not mirror the outcomes in a more widespread spread uh, real world use. So uh, larger real world data was required to decide upon the safety of Razumab so that we can use this drug with confidence. Hereby comes came our study which actually explored the ocular and safety profiles of real-world uh, Razumab over 15 tertiary care centers over a period of five years. We uh, had a total of 6,404 6, eyes, 9,406 injections. That was our study, which came out in ophthalmology and therapy uh, in June 2021. I'm uh, glad to share today's uh, talk with Dr. Jay Seth, who is also one of our panelists. So the present study reports the ocular and safety, systemic safety profiles. 
Uh, this is a multi-centric collaborative retrospective chart review. And uh, the total period between 2016 to 2020, uh, the patients with treatable colorectal vascular diseases, neovascular AMD, DME, and macular edema due to RVO were recruited. Uh, the treatment regimen varied from a, a retinal physician to physician. It could have been PRN from baseline or three monthly doses followed by PRN, treat and extend from baseline, three monthly doses followed by treat and extend. Now all the injections were performed in operation theater. After each injection, the patients were followed up on the second day, then after one month, uh, after one week, and then after one month. Additionally, all the patients were advised to follow up immediately if there was any systemic or ocular adverse event. Now the adverse events were classified into serious adverse events or serious adverse drug reaction versus non-serious adverse events or non-serious adverse drug reaction. An ACE or an ADR would be uh, that which would result in death or a life-threatening AE, that is adverse event, which would require inpatient hospitalization or prolongation of extend existing hospitalization and which might result in persistent or significant disability or incapacity. Now, all the events which did not fulfill this criteria were labeled as non-serious adverse event or non-serious adverse drug reaction. So a total of 31,645 intravitreal injections were performed during the study period, amongst which 9,406 Razumab injections were performed in I think he has lost connection. Yeah, I think Soman is um, lost uh, connection. Maybe we'll wait for a minute for him to reconnect. Seems to be an internet related issue. Just give a few seconds. Let us see. Yeah. So uh, till the time he comes back, uh, so uh, has how has been the safety kind of thing in uh, Shankar Netrala, the experience that you all are having? Safety is uh, is not an issue at all because except that few issues, few ethical uh, early early days we have some that inflammatory reaction, but we never stop giving because that isolated bash we had. Yeah, so man, you are back. Yeah, so man, yeah. I'm Can sorry. you reload your slides and go to and the we'll earlier? Start, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, I think my connection was a little uh, disturbed. Uh, since when uh, did it go off? Uh, so, Humanity Center uh, study those now uh, some six thousand uh, patient and nine thousand injections. Something that's like yes, you you were going through your clear slides of the study. Okay, okay. So I, I think uh, I was here. Can you, yeah, share your to, you have to share the yeah, please presentation. Share, please share your screen. Okay, 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 okay. Just a minute. Yeah, is it shared now? Yeah, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Can you go back? Go back. Go back, go back a bit. Uh, go back. Yeah, yeah. Go forward, forward, go forward, forward, forward. forward. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah, this, this is the one. Yeah, this, this is the, the slice. One. This is the one. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, it happened so many. Yeah. Uh, you're muted, Soman. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. 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 Okay, so amongst these patients, uh, to the total number of DME patients were about 33%. Uh, BRVO was 26% and new vascular AMD 15.2%. So uh, as far as the adverse events were concerned, the total number of adverse events were 
378, which was about 21%, but uh, the 772 mild ocular pain was 497. So uh, non-significant AE was a total of 1269. Non-significant adverse uh, drug reaction were about 652, which amounted to a little less than 7%. Now, coming to the serious adverse events, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, hyphema, and lens injury, we had total 10 patients, which amounted to 0.1%. And serious adverse drug reaction, ocular would be 34 which amounted to 0.36%, and systemic, uh, which were non-fetal MI, seven patients, non-fetal CVA, six patients, totaling to about 13, which is 0.21%. Now, in this real-world safety study of ranibizumab biosimilar, AEs were seen in 21% of injections, but 97% were non-serious. So uh, this is no, uh, no different from what that has been already been described in uh, with other anti drugs. The reenact 2 trials found that Razumab was safe and effective through uh, uh, for patients with neovascular AMD and RVO. Uh, in the real world series, 31 eyes had raised IOP, which were successfully managed with pressure lowering medication. Meta-analysis of clinical trials and real-world data report endophthalmitis rates between 0.026 to 0.056%. Our larger sample size detected an endophthalmitis rate of 0.01%, which is similar to other anti drugs. Now, intraocular inflammation has been reported with the use of rolicizumab. The incidence of, uh, of which we have seen in Hawk and Harrier studies was about 4%. Now, in our study, a non-infectious vitreitis rate was 0.02%. Biologics, as we all know, are protein derivatives, and hence they incite an immune reaction, potentially by producing anti-drug antibodies. Now, although biosimilars are produced by a process of reverse engineering, and they're very similar to the innovator molecule, they can potentially contain uh, impurities, which gives rise to IOIs. Now, systemic safety of intravitreal anti remains an unresolved issue. Uh, the reported rates of systemic adverse events uh, range between 0.6 to 13%. Now, in our study, we noted 13, that is 0.02% cases of non-fatal uh, APTC events. That has been uh, the criteria which had been laid down by the APTC guidelines. If this incidence were to be extrapolated to two years, per patient, and the, it would uh, uh, be an estimated rate of 4.8%. In addition to safety and efficacy, cost effectiveness is also considered by physicians. The high cost of many anti treatment regimens limits the number of treatments that the patient can afford. Now, biosimilars have been shown to reduce treatment costs to 25 to 50% compared to the parent biologic drug. The limitations of our study were that they were retrospective in design and they had a brief follow-up period. And we also lacked a control group against which a comparative study analysis could have been done as far as safety is concerned. So in a real world setting, intravitreal razumab therapy has an acceptable ocular and a systemic safety profile in the management of colorectal vascular disorders. Thank you, Soman. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, it is very nicely you've shown that the biosimilar is as safe as any other anti wager agents. And I'm sure you know it has proven to be a very safe uh, drug for us to use. Um, sir, we'll questions or any comments? Right? Yeah, yeah I think we'll have a discussion at the end because the we end, lost some yeah. time in the thing. Yeah. Right. So we will go to our next talk, and that is by Dr. Aditya Kerker, as uh, Dr. Aditya Kerker is going to speak on the response to uh, biosimilars in uh, observation on OCT biomarkers in neovascular AMD. Aditya, as we know, is a prolific surgeon from Pune. He is the heart of the National Institute of Ophthalmology. And I'm very proud to say that Aditya has won the Red Buckler Award at the ASRS 
for his video presentation. Um, Aditya, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. So I'm going to talk about uh, our experience of visual outcome safety profile and morphometric response of optical coherence tomography biomarkers to RAGMI uh, bizumab biosimilar treatment in neovascular AMD a real world experience. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the help by Dr. Jay Seit in this paper. There is no financial interest. So I would like to start with uh, what AMD is all about. Obviously, you all know that AMD is the leading cause of irreversible visual impairment amongst the elderly population. And with the current treatment modalities that are available include bevacizumab, ranibizumab, aflibercet, and prolucizumab, which are widely used throughout the world. Recently, in 2015, the Indian molecule of razumab was launched, and then it has become more and more popular nowadays. And however, there's still dearth of literature that analyzes the response of intravitreal razumab in various, uh, with the, in respect to various OCT biomarkers in neovascular AMD, especially in Indian scenario. So uh, what does this study add? It is like a real world study uh, of uh, outcomes of uh, razumab in neovascular AMD. We put the short term outcomes of safety profile and morphometric response of, on OCT biomarkers of this disease activity in neovascular AMD. So it's a retrospective study of 20 patients. Inclusion criteria was type 1 and type 2 uh, CNVM with uh, pigment epithelium detachment. Patients with type 3 CNVM were excluded and CNVM due to other causes and IPCV were also excluded. Simultaneously, the presence of other retinal pathologies like diabetic retinopathy was also excluded from the study. So at baseline and each visit, all the patients underwent best corrected visual acuity, intraocular pressure measurement, anterior segment evaluation, fundus examination, and swept source OCT and fluorescent angiography. Also, we did OCT angiography as and when it was possible. Each eye received intravitreal injection of razumab at a recommended dose of 10 milligrams per ml, that is 0.05 ml, every four weeks for three months. This injection was given at baseline four weeks, eight weeks respectively, and the patients were reviewed at the end of four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. All intravitreal injections were performed in the operation theater under all septic precautions. And the image analysis that was obtained included the central subfobial thickness that was calculated using 25 line raster scan protocol. Also the dense uh, scans were also carefully analyzed to look for maximum extent of the PED. And subsequently we also measured the dimensions of PED as well as width, as well as the height of pigment epithelium detachment with the inbuilt in calipers. PED was evaluated for the reflectivity and also we tried to differentiate it into serous, drusenide, fibrovascular, hemorrhagic or mixed. And the sections that were also evaluated for presence of intraretinal and subretinal fluid and extent of central retinal thickness. The changes in the best corrected visual activity, intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, central subfoveal thickness, central retinal thickness, and the height of PED as well as the width of the PED was compared to the baseline. All adverse event events were also monitored. So the age group was 68 plus or minus 13 was the mean age group. The male to female was 10 and 50% of the 50% of them were males. And PED uh, reflectivity, hyperreflective PED was seen in 85% of the patients, and the mixed reflectivity was seen in 15% of the patients. Best corrected visual acuity log mar was 1.38 at baseline. The median PED height was 264 millimeters. Median PED width was 2017 millimeters. And the uh, mean central macular thickness was 388, and central retinal thickness was 373 millimeters, micrometers. Baseline characteristics about uh, the subretinal fluid was seen in 60% of the patients and intraretinal fluid was seen in about 30% of the cases. Compared to the baseline, we saw that the improvement in the median visual acuity was noted in all the three, uh, load, after all the three loading doses, although it wasn't statistically significant. At week four, week eight, six eyes had more than three line improvement, which increased to eight lines at the end of 12 weeks. Nine eyes were stable at the end of 12 weeks, whereas one eye had improvement of only one line. Loss of one line was noted in respect at 12 weeks in one patient. None of the eyes showed complete resolution of the PED. At week four, eight, there was an improvement in PED dimensions, although it wasn't statistically significant. At 12 weeks, the height reduced significantly from baseline, that is 244 microns, while the reduction in the width was not so much significant. So these are some of the pictures which demonstrate the reduction in the height as well as the width of the pigment epithelium detachment along with resolution of the subretinal fluid at 12 weeks. OCT biomarkers again at 12 and 8 and 12 weeks statistically significant improvement was seen in central subfoveal thickness. 
at the same time also in the central retinal thickness. Resolution of the intraretinal fluid was seen in four eyes at four weeks and eight eyes. Also, it was uh, it improved in twelve five eyes in at twelve weeks. Complete resolution of subretinal fluid was seen in three eyes, five eyes, and nine eyes at the end of four weeks and eight weeks, twelve weeks respectively. The subretinal resolution was statistically significant at the end of eight and twelve weeks, as seen in this picture. So, to discuss about what we have come out with our results, the Razumab, as you know, is the first and only Indian anti-VEGF molecule available at this point of time. We would like to report our uh, improvement in vision at week four, week eight, and week twelve in neovascular AMD with in patients who have PED. This is obviously inclusive of type uh, uh, type one and type two CMVMs. On the whole, the real world experience shows that. Uh, the visual acuity was uh, the 90 percent of the patients maintained or improved the visual acuity at 12 weeks follow up. The PED typically encountered in uh, neovascular AMD patients were studied in this group. The Chan et al. have reported an improvement in PED height and volume after intravitreal aflibercept, and the Harbor studies also show similar results. And along with that, we also demonstrate that with the Indian biosimilar. The reduction in the PED height at 12 weeks, but there was no statistical improvement in visual acuity noted in our group. Although our group has limitations of being a short-term follow-up, at the same time the numbers are very less. That is only 20 in our group. Statistically, a significant improvement of central subfoveal thickness and central retinal thickness was also noted at 8 and 12 weeks respectively. Similar studies have been uh, similar uh, results have been shown in Minerva study and also a study by Wyckoff et al with other molecules. So the presence of intraretinal and subretinal fluid are considered to be important biomarkers for disease activity in neovascular AMD. In our study, we have noted that intraretinal fluid was seen in only 30% of the patients in baseline and it improved to 5% at week 12. Similarly, the resolution of the subretinal fluid was seen in 45% of the eyes compared to other, uh, result, other studies which show 53% as in red inact study. The better response of uh, OCT biomarkers to anti vegf therapy in the literature could probably be explained by the difference in the patient population, longer follow-up, and difference in the anti vegf molecules, as well as the suboptimal therapeutic response, which is often reported by the real-world settings. The anti vegf therapy has been associated with a small increase in the risk of thromboembolic events, but our uh, study shows that there were none in our group. Of course, our group is a very small study group, that is only 20 patients. Bevacizumab, as you know, is one of the cost-effective drugs available at the point of time, but it doesn't have the FDA approval. And the other molecules, which are imported ones, are slightly expensive than what is available today. So this gap between the cost price can be effectively taken care of by this Indian molecule, which is now approved for uh, AMD use and is being widely used across the country. Of course, there are limitations in this study. It's a retrospective design, a limited sample size, doesn't have a control arm, short term follow up, and we did not perform ICG in all the cases. But the strength of this study is that it's one of the first uh, studies which uh, uh, reports the efficacy of the real world data of uh, Indian molecule of Razumab. It also provides the qualitative as well as quantitative uh, assessment of Razumab on uh, various OCD biomarkers. So to conclude, uh, the use of intravitreal resumab is an emerging biosimilar which has promising morphological outcomes OCT-wise besides maintaining stable visual acuity with uh, acceptable safety profile. In addition, the low cost favors its use in Indian scenario and the treatment cost almost is reduced by 25 to 50% as compared to the branded drugs. The original article could be found in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology if anyone is interested. I once again thank uh, the All India Ophthalmic Society and uh, INTAS for including me in this uh, instruction course. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. Um, thank you, sir. Aditya. We have some time uh, for discussion, so we can take up the discussion. For sure, the sure. Two questions because, we can uh, if anybody has anything. Uh, so, Aditya, now, you know, uh, there is a lot of talk about fluid and, you know, the drying effectivity and uh, of intraretinal, subretinal, and even sub-RPE. So in a particular study, did you see any difference in any of these three compartment drawing or was it uniformly good for every compartment? Uh, so, sir, as I uh, mentioned in our results, uh, improvement is seen in all the three compartments. Obviously, the intraretinal fluid was anyway less in our study group. That was 30% to begin with. 
but as you also would agree that presence of intraretinal fluid in any of these AMD patients obviously indicate probably a poor response or a poor responsiveness to treatment in any molecules for that matter. Right. Um, so, I mean, I would like to ask you uh, about the systemic uh, ADR in this, uh, uh, your study. Was it comparable to the originator molecule or any differences at all? No, no it was uh, absolutely comparable to the originator molecule. Uh, and uh, it was comparable to other studies with uh, uh, biologic molecules. Okay, so anything different that you saw between the biosimilar uh, in this study about the safety or it is just on par with others? I would say uh, as far as our study goes and as far as my experience goes, I would say it is almost at par with the other molecules that we have. Uh, before 2019, yes, there had been sporadic cases of inflammation, sporadic cases of uh, reports of inflammation. Uh, fortunately, we haven't faced any in our hospital. Uh, but uh, since January 2019, I think uh, that has been taken care of. Absolutely, because even I have been using it for a very long time and not seen any significantly uh, different uh, ADRs or anything, and I'm as happy to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, comments from Dr. Pramod, sir? Yeah, basically, uh, what happened, anything new comes up. As a human nature, we have that hesitancy before using, and particularly when an established drug or established uh, option or choice you have, and anything new comes, that human nature will have that hesitancy to use it and then tendency to compare with the original one. I think that's what whole thing started. And unfortunately, to start with, you have few cases of adverse effect, or you say even a little bit shorter, because you have like some benchmark once in set in, everything want to compare to that, and you have one or two cases to start with. New spread so rapidly that everybody will be hesitant to use that new drug. I think that exactly what happened with this drug. But I think these people have come up with, the, I mean, well pan strategy. They analyze what exactly went wrong, identified the flaws, protein analysis, what was done, it was excellent. They went around, uh, explain everybody. They were open and transparent enough. That helps to boost the confidence also. Fortunately, all those events, I mean, I don't think any patient lost vision in that. He has exaggerated inflammatory response for a couple of days or three days, which we had, and then eventually it all settled down. So I think that again, uh, over a period of time, that anxiety settled down. And I think it is now compared as per, I think all of us are using right from inception. Yes, we initially we did our own study of maybe 30, 40 eyes to start with. And then we were, we thought just we were confident enough that things were okay. And we never stopped. Even in between those couple of incidences that happened that time also, we never stopped injecting. And we did not have any problem after that. And then like inherent risk, what you have with any intravitreal injection is comparable with this also. This like any other procedure related complication for drug wise. I think we did not have any problems, so we just continue. And over, I think, okay. just I was checking more than 4,000 injections. We cannot compare with Disha. Disha, they are far ahead from beginning only. Uh, but uh, because we started a little bit late and we, we wanted our own analysis before going ahead open for everybody. So we just still cross, I think, around 4,000 injections. So, Soman, what is the figure in Disha? Of, uh, how many injections have you all done? Uh, well, uh, the study has been, when we uh, had this study, for, as far as our inclusion criteria criterion goes, there were about 9,400 uh, patients. No, this is just for the study. I'm just asking overall in Disha, without the study, how many have you must have been I more mean, than 20 now. Yeah, only resume? <laughs> yes, You're asking yes. about only resume? Yeah, it should be at, yes. around, around, I think, 18 to 20,000. Yeah. So that's a, that's a tremendous figure. And that just speaks so much that of your faith in this uh, particular molecule to be used. Right. You still give Avastin right. and you all totally stop, uh, Dr. Saumain? No, no uh, sir. Avastin we, have totally, we have totally stopped Avastin since 2015. Good. I mean, so, sir, actually, this molecule has contributed in a big way for, you know, uh, allowing ophthalmologists to shift from 
uh, off label use to a molecule which is labeled and safer and you know that is the biggest contribution of this biosimilar that has helped us to switch over from a off label drug to a a label drug in our day to day practice yeah, is exactly. it so many actually probably ashish will also add on because canada i think the huge amount of like uh, they because health system is such government pays for everything and i think biosimilars are i think canada started whole thing but i will take that question later on maybe next talk if your time permits or at the end okay we'll go ahead next yes, talk yes definitely so uh, i now in way invite uh, dr avinandra gupta uh, he is from faridabad and he is the director of nayan jyoti eye and laser center he is uh, done his uh, fellowship at uh, arvind eye hospital and arvind is known for his numerous presentations and his publications he is of course won the best video award at the uh, european the euretina which was held in london and uh, he is going to talk to us about the caesar study over to you avinand uh, thank you uh, nishikant uh, thank you pramod sir and thank you intas and aigus for giving me this opportunity to present our study this is first of all a kind study that is clinical efficacy and safety of rezumab and we named this study as caesar study our experience with the world first biosimilar rezumab and this was the first publication for rasumab and the main author is dr lalit parma and the presenting author it got published in uh, feb 2021 in igo uh, coming to the introduction retinal disease management has bit- witnessed revolutionary advances in pharmacotherapy with the development of biological molecules that inhibit vegf such as ranuzumab bevacizumab alfabestab doluzumab in management of amd dme and macloedema due to vascular occlusion since anti vegf therapy needs repeated injection so cost effectiveness becomes a major issue thereby cost effective therapy like avastin and rasumab that is biosimilar became popular what is a biosimilar uh, know what is a biosimilar we should know what is an biologic actually biologic is a recombinant therapeutic protein that prevents and treat uh, that prevents and treat to cure a disease recombinant therapeutic protein basically means it's a sequence of amino acids and as compared to the generic drug which is a molecule recombinant therapeutic protein needs recombinant therapeutic uh, protein needs and reactor and uh, genetic uh, recombinant uh, technology where the gene is modified and is injected into a vector which is uh, actually a bacteriophage and this bacteriophage infects uh, the e coli cell line and the e coli the active cell produces the proteins and which is then uh, segregated from a pool of uh, uh, secretions and purified so biosimilar is a biologic that is highly similar to the reference product with no clinically meaningful difference in terms of safety purity and potency so it's almost similar to the innovator product uh, the aim of this study was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of rasumab for the treatment of chorioretinal vascular diseases such as diabetic macroedema cnvm and macroedema secondary to rvo the primary uh, uh, aim the primary outcome what we measured was uh, the mean change in cdva that is the visual equity and uh, central foveal thickness from baseline to 1 month and 3 months the secondary outcome what was measured was safety of the drug and systemic adverse even during any follow up visit cdva measured by snell visual equity chart was converted to logarithm of the minimal angle of resolution that we call as a logmar scale for statistical analysis and central foveal thickness was defined as the distance between the internal limiting membrane and the inner border of retinal pigment epithelium it was a single center retrospective study done at center of site uh, new delhi and dwarka center between october 2018 to september 2019 the institutional ethic committee approval was obtained the population which was chosen was 
treatment naive patients or previously treated with other anti-vegep uh, therapy, steroids or laser therapy were included in the study. Patients uh, who didn't follow this parameters, that is three months follow-up, dense cataract, corneal opacity, ocular infection, previous vitrectomy, uncontrolled glaucoma, history of MI or uh, cerebrovascular uh, accident were excluded. Coming to the result, uh, the mean number of patients, uh, what we had was 153, 56% uh, were male and 43% was female. DME and AMD accounted for 45.8% uh, of the total number of cases and RVO accounted for 8.4% of the Treatment naive patients was 80% and previously the treated patient was 20%. If you see the result, uh, uh, this is one uh, uh, the mean logmar of the indication improves significantly from 0.62, that is 0.62 to 0.42 uh, at the end of three months post injection, which is which was statistically highly significant. 45 eyes had gained more than two lines of visual activity of Snell's chart. The CDVA improved in 97% of eyes and remain the same in 55 percent, 55 eyes and version in only one eye. If we see, look at the uh, central foveal thickness, uh, it was 405 microns and after, uh, two, uh, up, after three months, it reduced to 271 microns, uh, 97 or 63.4 percent eye had more than 25 percent reduction in central foveal thickness and 45.1% eyes showing more than 100 micron decrease in CFT from baseline. After an injection, CFT improved in what 96.7% of eyes and worsened in 3.3%. Uh, this is a bar chart. You can see uh, this is a mean logmar chart. And uh, if you can see that the blue is uh, baseline and at one month and uh, three months, there was a drastic improvement in DME cases. This is CNVM and this is RBO cases. In all the three groups, uh, the logmar visual equity improved. This is uh, another bar chart showing CFT. This is the baseline. And uh, you can see uh, after one month and three months, uh, the vision has, in, uh, the central foveal thickness has improved. So to come to the discussion, Razumab is the first and the only approved biosimilar to Ranuzumab being used clinically at present. In this study, we have assessed the short-term three months clinical efficacy and safety of Razumab in patients with chorioretinal vascular diseases like CNVM, diabetic macular edema, and the macular edema due to branch vein occlusion. Uh, CDVA, uh, or the visual equity improves significantly as early as one month after the administration of biosimilar Ranuzumab. The mean logma CDBA improved from baseline 0 0.6 to one month to 0.45 and maintained till three months to 0 0.42. The mean CFT showed significant reduction from baseline 40568 microns to at 86 microns at one month and 271 microns at three months, which was statistically highly significant. The percentage change in CFT was 29.5% at one month and 33.2% at three months. In 121 uh, patients treatment naive-wise, the mean CDVA improved significantly from baseline to month three in each group. The mean percent of percent of change in CFT was 37% in naive DME eyes, 26.7 in naive CNVM eyes, and 39.6 in naive RVO eyes at the end of three months. There was no evidence of toxicity or immunogenicity was noted after intravitreal administration of biosimilar Ranuzumab. None of the eye had IOP more than 20 at day one. Also, no systemic uh, adverse events were reported up to three months follow up. Uh, the findings of this study are consistent with the data reported at, uh, in the in, in study and by Samira et al. 
Our study evaluated patients who had received one to three injections and observed higher mean percentage change in CDVA and CFT at one month compared to RENAX study, which showed a change of less than 5% at one month. However, at three months follow-up, the findings were almost similar between the studies. Regarding safety, both studies reported no evidence of uh, any uh, uh, safety concern. Because of the lower cost, biosimilar reduces the health care cost, more accessible and uh, affordable. Biosimilar have advantage in developing countries like India, where insurance companies do not reimburse for anti vegf agents. And also, we do not have compounding pharmacies, so uh, giving uh, Avastin is a difficult scenario. Insurance company can give significant, uh, can have significant saving if they uh, approve their, this drug, uh, saving of 15 to 20 percent due to multiple injections. Government can also save on the health expenditure because of the lower cost of the drug. So, to conclude, biosimilar ranuzumab is a safe and effective low-cost therapy in patients with chorioretinal vascular disease such as DME, CNVM and macular edema secondary to RBO. The data showed a rapid improvement in CDVA and central foveal thickness in most of the eye with efficacy observed as early as one month and maintained till three months. Drug was well tolerated with new, uh, new safety issues over a period of three months. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Avinandra. Super presentation of a very unique study. I think we'll uh, take up with the discussion after we present uh, the other two talks. So, you know, we know that the safety and efficacy of the biosimilars has been now proven and it is fantastic. So it's good for us and we know that we can trust on this molecule. So there has been a shift in the trends in using anti-VEGF biosimilars. And I now invite uh, Dr. Jay Seth, who will be speaking on this changing trends in using anti-VEGF biosimilars in practice. Uh, Jay Seth is uh, the young retina gun from uh, Mumbai. He is with Surya Eye Hospital, and he does pole-to-pole -pole surgery. Uh, I'm saying pole-to-pole -pole because he does refractive surgery and retinal surgery with the equal skill, which is a rare combination to have. Uh, Jay, are you around? Yes, sir. Hi, good evening, sir. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jay. For the, yeah thanks for the kind introduction, sir. So, yeah. uh, we'll and Jay ahead. is uh, unique because he is good in his academic uh, work as well as he likes to publish and he is one of the bright uh, shining stars of Retina, the young guns from Mumbai. And it's always nice to have him in Mumbai. Over to you, Jay. My pleasure, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. So I'll start with my presentation. That is the changing trends in the use of anti vitreous biosimilars. So, uh, so as you know, biologics that inhibit the action of uh, vascular endothelial growth factors have uh, revolutionized the management of various colorectal disorders over the past 12 to 13 years. And globally, the uh, recombinant anti of agents that are currently being used include uh, bevacizumab that is marketed at Evastin, ranibizumab that is used in this or in India, afibercept that is IVR, and zolosuzumab that is bovo or pagenes in India. So before moving on to the survey, uh, we just quickly go to a few important aspects of the health economics. So treatment of retinal vascular conditions usually requires that intravitreal injections be repeated over the course of many years, thereby incurring a very high cumulative drug cost. And cost is an important determinant of medical decision making and drug selection in most countries. And this makes a shift towards less expensive biosimilar and attractive strategy. A biological drug usually takes around 10 to 15 years to develop and at a cost of roughly around 1.2 to 1.5 billion dollars. Now, in contrast, a uh, biosimilar agent usually takes around 5 to 10 years to develop and the cost of production is usually around 120 to 150 million. That is around one tenth of the actual cost of the biological agent. Now, this is because the uh, research and development that is involved in producing a biosimilar by the process of reverse engineering is much lesser as compared to the innovator biological agent. 
and also fewer clinical trials are necessitated to obtain the regulatory approval. So this makes the unit cost of a biosimilar uh, much uh, cheaper as compared to the innovative molecule. And if we see India itself is an enormous market for biologics, and this is valued at roughly at around four billion dollars, and which is the third highest in the Asian Pacific region. So because of all these important parameters, uh, we saw the one of the first. Uh, biological agents, uh, biosimilar agents to be developed in India, that is Rajamap. And uh, it was approved by the DCGI in the year 2015 after a phase three trial showed efficacy in 103 ICU patients of neovascular AMD. Now, the cost of a Rajamap roughly ranges from 140 to 150 US dollars as compared to a Lucent aid that costs around 300 dollars in India and Ilya around 630 dollars in India. There are few viruses and biosimilar agents also available, but there are very few physicians who are actually using it. So we'll go to the 2018 and the 2020 VRSI biosimilars of anti-virus survey, that is a white survey. Now to better understand the attitudes of Indian Victorian specialists towards the biosimilars, the Victorian Society of India conducted online surveys in the year 2018 and 2020. The questions were formulated uh, in order to find out more about the drug safety, efficacy, and economic, and economic impact onto the patient's perception and experience with antivirus biosimilars. In the year 2018, 112 members participated in the survey, and in 2020, 98 society members participated. So we'll go through the results one by one. So the first question was addressed whether they were aware of biosimilar agents of antivirus. So in both the years 2018 and 2020, the majority of the respondents were aware of antivirus, which was almost 100% in 2020 as compared to 96% in 2018. Now, regarding the usage of biosimilars, the proportion of respondents using a ranibizumab biosimilar increased from 41% in 2018 to 56% in the year 2020. Whereas those using a bevacizumab biosimilar decreased from 9% in 2018 to 2% in the year 2020. Now, if they were asked whether if they have used a biosimilar drug, whether they are likely to continue it in the future also. So uh, when, uh, when they looked at this answer, they were more likely to use a randomization of biosimilar, which increased from 73 to 82% as compared to a bevacizumab biosimilar. Next, uh, the questions were formulated to know the primary uh, important aspects of all these Biosimilars, that is the safety as well as the efficacy. So, from the year 2018 to 2020, there was a substantial increase in the proportion of respondents who were satisfied with the efficacy of the ranibizumab biosimilar, which increased from 65% to 81%. At the same time, the proportion of respondents who were satisfied with the efficacy of the bevacizumab biosimilar remained roughly unchanged, that is, it was 29% in 2018 and 30% in 2020. Regarding the safety, the proportion of respondents who were satisfied with the safety of ranibizumab in biosimilar increased from 61% in 2018 to 68% in 2020. And at the same time, from 2018 to 2020, the proportion of participants satisfied with the safety of the bevacizumab biosimilar decreased from 30% to 25%. Next, the one very important that was uh, addressed was regarding the approval of the biosimilar agents. So most of the participants, that is almost nine out of 10 participants in both 2018 and 2020, believe that biosimilar drugs should be approved only after completion of clinical trials that are larger and are better designed than those are already performed. Because if you see the current biosimilar uh, approval is usually based in one or two clinical trials, which are usually short term, maybe around 48 to 52 weeks and with a smaller number of participants. So that is one important area that needs to be addressed in the future. And uh, regarding the affordability of the biosimilar agents, in the year 2020, 92% of the respondents felt that the biosimilar drugs have made antivirus treatment more affordable to the general population as compared to 83% of the respondents in the year 2018. Now, when, this was a very interesting question that was asked, whether the present cost of ranibizumab biosimilar, which was roughly around $130 in 2018, was appropriate to substitute Avastin. So uh, in that, we found that a very similar proportion of respondents, that is around 40 and 37% of the uh, respondents said that it was sufficient enough. 
and under next the last question that was addressed what was the price of the biosimilar agent that the respondents expected at which they would like to switch to uh, bio to rajuna from the current avastin so there were four choices that were given that is uh, ina 4000 5500 6000 and 7000 so in 2018 the survey participants selected the switching price as uh, 4000 rupees that is 46% followed by uh, 7000 6000 and 5500 now in 2020 also a majority of the participants uh, that is around 32% chose 4000 as a price at which they would like to switch and uh, as compared to that there were fewer patients who actually selected uh, 6000 rupees at this stage but if we see most of the participants they wanted a lower price roughly around 4000 to 5500 at which they would like to switch to uh, biosimilar So let's come to the discussion. Uh, the primary safety and efficacy of these anti-aging drugs is very important to physicians and to patients, particularly when it comes to selecting a biosimilar. The RNA2 trial in the NAMD showed significant improvement in the visual acuity, the sense of subtle thickness, intraretinal and subretinal fluid at 28 weeks, whereas the analogous RNA2 trials in RBO also showed Razumab as an effective treatment option in RBO. By significantly improving the visual acuity and reducing the macular thickness at 48 weeks. Now, safety is one of the very important aspects, especially when it comes to biosimilars, because they are known to incite immunological reactions when given inside the eye. There were cases of several endophthalmitis that were reported after injection from the initial batches of lazumab in the year 2015, and subsequently in 2017 and 2019. Now, in response to the inflammation. Intas had promptly recalled all these vials from the implicated batches and temporarily halted the further production and refined the manufacturing process before releasing the new vials into the market. Now, although these episodes of stutter and off were being investigated, the VRSI had advised its members to stop using ranibastamab uh, for the time being, and these advisories were issued in August 2015, in March 2017, and in February 2019. And only when the safety of the newly manufactured batches were concerned, the members were again notified that they can carefully begin using the batches. However, the initial utilization data suggested that the members were hesitant to begin uh, restarting the batches again into the clinical practice. So the VRSI decided to repeat its biosimilar survey in the year 2020 after the last reported cluster of sudden end off was seen in February 2019. And this repeat survey provided valuable data. to compare the physician's current perspective and drug use with those from 2018 now coming to the key aspect of the wide survey results the survey that was done in 2020 found that the physicians became increasingly satisfied with the safety and efficacy of rasumab from 2018 and during the same period the respondents reported a reduction in the satisfaction with the efficacy of bevacizumab biosimilar whereas the satisfaction with its safety was essentially unchanged Now, interestingly, more than twice as many respondents are satisfied with the safety and efficacy of rasumab as compared to the bevacizumab biosimilar. And despite the episodes of rasumab-related cell and end off, there is a trend among the retinal specialists in India to increasingly use this drug in their practice. And furthermore, respondents are more comfortable with rasumab in the year 2020, despite the cell and end off cluster of 2019. And respondents were also asked to estimate the price of rasumab biosimilar. That would increase its use instead of Avastin, and more respondents choose dollar fifty for that is four thousand rupees as the pivot price in both the surveys. All the proportion decreased from forty two to thirty three percent. So the surveys indicated that retinal specialists are generally willing to accept a higher than if they may buy a similar price in twenty twenty as compared to twenty eighteen to move patients away from Avastin, and this willingness to pay is what we call it price. Is approximately one third the actual cost of this agent, and marginally lower than the current price of Razumab. Now there are currently there are a lot of issues with Razumab also, with the lack of FDA approval, coupled with unresolved safety and medical legal concerns prevent Razumab and its biosimilars from being widely used. And incidents of compounding related endophthalmitis led Indian regulatory authorities to temporarily ban this agent in 2016. And such events they limit the availability of a low-cost antivirus agent, which is a significant problem in the developing world. So, approved low-cost biosimilars such as Razumab 
which is packaged as a single use vial definitely has the ability to fill this void now if you look at the usage pattern of rasumab over the years it has increased significantly from uh, around 2800 in 2015 to almost reaching up to 50000 in the year 2019 so this study represents the only survey data on the physical perception of antiviral biosimilars in india and the two year interval between the surveys both validates the original survey data and identifies the trend However, there are a few limitations, including the lower participation rate among the interim VR specialists, and uh, this low participation rate limits the interpretation of the results to plus minus five percent, and lack of data regarding the number of respondents in the 2020 survey who had actually participated in the 2018, and also we did not have the demographic data of the participants that would have really helped us know whether what kind of agents were uh, the VR specialists using. in taiwan cities in taiwan two cities and also whether there is any difference between patients who are in the private practice and in an institutional based practice so to conclude the introduction of biosimilars have given indian veterinary specialists additional antiviral drug options and the vrs survey established that physicians are very well aware of biosimilars and there is an increasing trend towards prescribing a ranibizumab biosimilar physicians are generally satisfied with the safety and efficacy of biosimilars but they believe that more rigorous trials should be conducted prior to regulatory approval a third of the respondents feel that rasumab is appropriately priced but they acknowledge that a further price reduction would be necessary for rasumab to become the drug of first choice the us patents of lucentis and ilia are supposed to end later this year whereas the european patents are supposed to expire in year 2022 and 2025 and with with the patents of these biologics about to expire and the acceptance of biosimilars growing as we see from our study a shift from branded drugs towards biosimilars in the developed nations may definitely occur and on the same as there are uh, more than 20 25 biosimilar agents that are currently under various stages of development and phase and this is table provides a list of them and uh, for further reading of our article it can be referred to the ico february 2021 edition and here i would like to just acknowledge all of my co-authors and the uh, vrsi for providing me this opportunity to work on this very important project and uh, once again to uh, eios and to ita for giving me this platform to present to present this study thank you very much thanks jay excellent presentation and very elaborately uh, uh, you know shown fantastic uh, presentation jay thank you thank thanks you. a lot so now we move on to the last talk uh, that we have for today and then we'll have the discussion uh, i invite dr ashish sharma to speak his talk uh, to give his talk on the bira study ashish sharma as we know is associated with the lotus eye hospital but he is known for his uh, prolific uh, publications that he has and the studies he has got He has done his retina fellowship from the Irvine uh, Institute in California, and then he has done his additional retina fellowship from the Bascom Pharma Institute. We know Ashish for the numerous presentations that he has done and his innovations for the retcam that he has uh, done. He's got the uh, patent pending for the fundus imaging device called the N2 retcam. and of course he has been given the international ophthalmologist education award by the american academy he is on the editorial board of most of the high impact journals so i would like to call uh, dr ashish sharma to give his talk on the bira study ashish thank you dr uh, nishikant for kind introduction and uh, regards to dr pramod and uh, all the colleagues uh, good evening so Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet, Ashish. Uh, now? Yeah, now it's seen. Now it's seen. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, means uh, I'm going to present our recent paper which we published, and it came online just two to three days before. And, uh, it was ranibizumab biosimilar versus lucentis in cases of neovascular AMD efficacy and the safety analysis. the name of the study is called bira study and i would like to acknowledge the contributors and the help from our international colleagues and especially i would like to highlight the 
contribution and the help from my two of the very bright DNV candidates, Dr. Neelesh Kumar and Dr. Nikola Parachuri. We have been publishing in the area of biosimilars since the last couple of years, and the, these two students have been very, very instrumental in all the work. So regarding financial disclosures, I do have financial to disclose because I'm consultant for Intas, and this is basically an Intas platform for this particular session. So this is the study that we published, came online two days before. The question was that why was the need of this kind of a study? Because we had a lot of data in terms of resumab about the safety and efficacy. We have no doubt that the drug is safe and efficacious because you, know, you see the data from this year with phenomenal data from 9,000 plus injections. And you know, personally, we all clinicians have uh, uh, since then we have felt it that you know, the drug is no inferior to the originated drug. So why was the need? But if you look uh, at the data, which is, a published, which is in the published domain, there was no data which was comparing Lucentis versus, Lucentis versus the biosimilar Resumab. So although we all clinicians know that you know, drug works as good as Lucentis, but there was nothing on the published domain. So there were a lot of multiple single arm scientific studies were published. So we felt the need. And uh, then the study design was retrospective chart review of treatment naive neovascular AMD patients. We had at least uh, mandatory two visits to be included in the study at four weeks interval and whether they were given Resumab or Lucentis. So between 2018 to 2020. And minimum of eight weeks follow-up, obviously, because we have a couple of injections mandatory here. And we have excluded all the patients who had anything other than neovascular AMD or any kind of vitro-retinal interface disease. And we watched these patients for next six months, but our primary outcome was at eight week, which is in line with the international recommendations for biosimilar testing at this point. So a study design, as far as... Uh, Best corrective visual equity was concerned. It was measured with Snellens, converted into ETDR's letter score for the analysis. And then central subfield thickness with the spectral domain OCT, we use OptaView 3D OCT. And the IOP measurement, all these things were done at each visit. A study design-wise, as I said, primary outcome was eight weeks for both safety and efficacy. And we did further analysis and we followed these patients up to 24 weeks also. And efficacy was determined on the basis of comparison of BCVA and the central macular thickness. And the safety was assessed on a rough uh, protocol. Basically, I called it that as a clinical immunogenicity. That's what we have been talking and documenting since we are publishing in this area. And the positive uh, immunogenicity was noted if clinician as I was the only investigator here, if I have noted anything in terms of the inflammation, whether it's anterior or posterior at any point of time in my file. And it was negative if I did not find anything. A study design was usual statistical analysis for the separate arms unpaired T test and for the baseline data uh, and uh, for the categorical data, chi-squared test. And we made sure that at baseline in both the arms, Resumab, and the Lucentis arm, things were pretty same. So if you look at the demographic data, you have mean age in both the groups, same, no different. Male to female ratio, same, no different. Even at the baseline, ETDR score was same, around 45 letters, and CMT was also same at the baseline. Mean number of injections during the 24 weeks, well, till where we followed all these patients were also similar. So as far as uh, you know, precise results are concerned, this, this is the table. We could not find any difference at the primary endpoint, which was at eight weeks. And even further going down the lane at 24 weeks, there was no difference in terms of the letter score. CMT, macular thickness was also found relatively same, no different in terms of the analysis, both at primary endpoint at four weeks and at the 24 weeks. Safety was we did not find any kind of negative clinical immunogenicity at any point of time till the 24 weeks. We did have you know, weaknesses in the study, obviously small sample size 
And uh, we had all kind of flaw that any retrospective design would have, including the short follow-up. But to be frank, short follow-up, not a real negative or weakness anymore if you are comparing biosimilar with an originator, because that's how the recommendations are being given now by, by FDA and the EMA. The only limitation and the weakness I would say, and I accept that probably, you know, we did not categorize and that should happen. You know, if you really want to compare two drugs, uh, you know, it's better to compare and try to categorize what kind of MNB are you treating with, especially if you have a PCV in that. Although in our group, we did not have any PCV patient. And the ideal way of immunogenicity testing is to assess the anti-drug antibodies, which we published in 2019. And now we are seeing that that is happening with brolicizumab. But in a retrospective settings, ADAs are not possible. So ADA usually are the part of any prospective trial, especially the phase three trial, when these drugs are being tested. And now ADA has come as on forefront, which was not the case before. Now, any trial in terms of any anti-VEGF or biologics have to have ADAs measured. So, uh, Regarding biosimilars, I think all the speakers have clearly defined, even Jay told, you know, people are aware now. And just to re-emphasize, these are not the copy molecules. They cannot be just uh, copy-paste molecules of the originator, bios, originator biologics because they do not get the proprietary information from the uh, originator and manufacturer. So they need to do the reverse engineering. So some no, non-clinically meaningful differences are accepted and uh, uh, so, you know, drugs can be different. If you want to know more details about what is update, you know, what are the drugs on the horizon, you can refer our paper, which was published last year. And India has a lot to offer in terms of experience. I think uh, presenters presented from Delhi, from uh, Kolkata. So I think each, each and every part of the country have experienced all positive about, about this drug. And the way manufacturer has taken the drug and responded and rectified is, is phenomenal means to bring a biologic from a country like India is not, it not uh, less. So we have a lot of lessons, you know, which world can learn from India. Means we will discuss that. Dr. Pramod was pointing about the Canada. So we'll discuss that later. And uh, the only aspect that West should learn, and you know, that's what they are doing is, there's an effect called the nocebo impact. Nocebo means negative perception. Biosimilars are blamed and unfortunate to have nocebo perception all across the globe. This is not about the ophthalmology. This is about even the systemic biosimilars. So education is very, very important and FDA is on it and FDA is trying to uh, you know, work on this uh, direction. And even if you look at the EMA website, you have the main education page whenever they have you know, biosimilar approval pathway on their website. So uh, I would really like to acknowledge our team. You know, we have published almost 20, uh, 30 articles on biosimilars since last, uh, uh, bio, not biosimilars and biologics in last couple of years. There's a lot of teamwork and I've already highlighted some of the colleagues who have helped us in that. In that. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And, uh, and if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer. Uh, well, thank you, Ashish. Wonderful presentation as usual and a very nice study for us to know. So, you know, in conclusion, I would say that we know that this biosimilar is fantastic. It's safe. It works very well. And the only thing which can point out to certain deficiency was the lack of an initial study of effectivity or safety, which they didn't do at a very large scale with a lot of numbers as compared to a very small number they, well, that was used to get the FDA approval. So I will uh, go uh, hand it over either to Dr. Prabhupada, maybe to take the discussion further uh, about this fantastic molecule, sir. I, I, I think excellent presentations and I think just, I think what we conclude with all these presentations, yeah, the biosimilars are as good as their primary molecules. And yes, cost is the issue. And because uh, what we talk about patients always and human perception, everybody thinks the more expensive drug is, the better efficacy is. And that's what goes on. So 
but when you have a one injection second injection third injection fourth injection they realize and over a period of time they start asking do you have any cheaper option you have and that is what exactly drives things so and and yes it's a huge burden direct cost indirect cost as well we all are looking forward where you have a long acting uh, drugs where you can have a interval of 3 months or 4 mm-hmm. months and if something like that 6 months and if you have even eye drops like that works out i think that's a dream yeah but yes coming back to buy similars they are going to stay here and we were talking about what i wanted to ask ashish that time because we know and what he has i think touched already is not only ophthalmic drug what we are talking about in overall industry and all systemic drugs canada is i think there's a four of front as far as bias mills are concerned because government bears a majority cost and when government bears majority cost government has to look for alternative options uh, i mean otherwise it just whole budget will wiped off so a similar thing is happening slowly in india fortunately i think we are having a insurance company slowly accepting that is a part of treatment and accept like a, they have started paying back for insure covering under insurance which um, was not there and then that used to be a huge problem as well ashish if you would like to yes i have a few points to clarify here i think because uh, as first thing which was pointed out that the larger clinical trial So yes. now if you look at the FDA and the EMA recommendations you do not require larger clinical trial it's a proper pyramid you need a smaller clinical trial so it means we were all under the impression that you should have the larger numbers which is not the case so they just need to establish equivalence at the background and second point is doctor as doctor pramod was pointing out regarding the canada actually canada approached me because uh, they they have a agency called the international federation of aging so after seeing our work on bio similar they approached me and we had a, a symposium with them and you know so i am truly humbled to say that one of our paper which was published in terms of the approval pathways for bio similars was un- being referred by the government in terms you know how the approval should take place so what and the, recently what happened if uh, you know that sb11 data was published in phase 3 there's a very important point i'm going to highlight here is if you look at the primary end point in that sb11 data the trial was headed by dr neil bressler if you look at the primary end point they were they had two primary end point one was bcva and one was cmt and these two primary end points one was from for fda and one was for ema so actually both are on the different page in terms of the primary end point so we actually wrote a letter and a editorial to ophthalmology that you know clarify on this aspect but uh, but our paper was rejected then pa- evaluator was from fda dr willy he wrote a letter to us that i want to bring this information into public domain so still in spite of knowing so many things ophthalmology is still immature in terms of the guidance and fda and ema they are on, not on the same page even on the timing and i think uh, next session is there so last point i would make that even regarding the longevity longevity primary end points are very well accepted in 8 weeks because that is the time when you can assess the change and the safety aspect because most of the time it is the inflammation which reacts immediately except the brolicizumab which uh, you know shown the surprises thank you very much thank you very much also to jay's presentation i think it was excellent presentation jay what again adds on their acceptability because i see as an institutional practice and a private practice you look at it because pooling patient for bevacizumab is, is a huge practical issues and the moment apart from uh, you are having a, a allocating dose and other things the safety issues are obviously always there and if you do not have number pooled uh, then if you stever that drug once vial is open it adds on again huge concern institutional practice actually what we do is we like a divide drug right in the theater and finish within that hour or two which probably not practicable in a private practice and that also adds on acceptability or rather convenience i would say when you are using this biosimilars coming into play so that again having a huge boost with that
market now. And uh, Samsung, is also there. yeah, Samsung is there. Mm-hmm. Uh, few others are coming up, but right now our experience is with Intas. Others they are trying to push through, but I think Reliance is cost is a little bit more. They price more than uh, Intas one, if I remember correctly. So, uh, I, but when that they just come like few months back. and sipla has recently come like uh, last few days only suddenly i saw the email and sipla people they are bringing up their one but then last session we were talking about afternoon session about uh, having their issues as fda approval and other things um, like uh, we are i think uh, little bit here when they are not at approach to us so i don't have any experience along with uh, like, uh, other bio similar except i would say in tas at least today scenario ashish do you have any experience with other yes, we have one case series uh, which is under review by the ajo mm-hmm. a, about the renezurel mm-hmm. so means very short case series means i cannot comment on in terms of the safety but it means it, i did not use it but we have the data which is under review so drug found to be efficacious and uh, in our series it was safe also but uh, the data was too small to comment on the safety and uh, actually if you look at the ago review we could could not include renezurel in our uh, paper because they did not any, anything on paper to refer it refer it nishikant to add anything your experience or uh, dr avnindra nishikant go ahead so i have been using uh, this biosimilar right from the time it was launched and i always firmly believed and i actually took a lot of pride to know that the first biosimilar came in from india and that was a moment of pride and uh, i've been using it for the last many years and i have not come across any side effect of this particular molecule now the another biosimilar that you just said from sipla actually it's the reliance one which is getting marketed by sipla sipla is not manufacturing it oh i didn't know that part <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> i did not know Because, that part yeah yeah so it is the same biosimilar of reliance which is being marketed by sipla now in the name as visumab mm-hmm. so uh, i would like to ask avinendra and uh, 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 dr aditya about in your studies did you have a subset like you know pcv did you find something different with this molecule or you know a pure amd cases did you find any difference at all as compared to the original mod- originator molecule or uh, you find it equally effective even if you study the subset of amds see pcv we know ki ranuzumab is not the drug of choice in pcv cases so uh, okay. automatically uh from uh, ilia has been launched uh, two to three years back and with ilia for you program i think uh, if we diagnose pcv the first offer what we give to the patient is uh, ilia or alprobisep we don't go in for any biosimilar or eccentric uh we have used uh, <clears throat> what was the second question uh, nishika Oh, same if uh, any difference in the separate subsets that you've seen any actual so, difference uh, we don't have with um, see the, we have been segregating patients so uh, we don't have a lot of experience about ranuzumab working in pcv uh, but okay uh, in pd is anything difference you've seen pd not much of a difference okay aditya anything right. to add Soman has a huge series. We he has he has excluded a PCV or his series also had ex PCV as well. No, we had excluded PCV uh, because I uh, we thought that it would uh, further complicate matters. And as we know, PCV till now we are treating with uh, aflibercept. Uh, and in when we started the series, actually uh, we were treating PCV as a combination therapy. Specifically, if there were B, B uh, BVNs, we used to go for PDT combined with. uh antigen jets 
But later on, uh, since there was uh, more literature uh, supporting monotherapy, we shifted from that. And uh, because of this, we had actually excluded PCB from our series. Okay. Uh, Jay, coming to you, uh, in your survey, you said that uh, on an average price, the Indian uh, doctors were ready to pay was roughly about, say, uh, 4,000 to 5,000 rupees. Yep. Is it true? Yes. So, uh, uh, so can you elaborate more on that? So if you put this pricing, how does it benefit and how does it work? See, uh, unfortunately, the thing is, this were the four choices, you know, that were given to all the participants that were there. Uh, the mm -hmm. I, I, I wasn't part of the 2018 survey, you know, that was designed. So I wasn't part of the design. So I, I cannot comment on to the reasons why those economics were considered. The pricing of 4,000, 5,500, uh, 6,000 and 7,000 right over there. Uh, but if you ask me personally, I think 4,000 would be a very economically unviable option to sell that now. I would think a, a realistic price, maybe, you know, maybe around 7,000 or something would be a good uh, price range what can be offered. And, you know, that would be on par with uh, Elastin. And uh, coming to the other thing, I have actually uh, tried the Bevacism app by, uh, biosimilars I did. So it has worked equally well. So I think that the, the while cost some around 12,000 and something. So we were actually for the poor patients, we were offering it for three and a half thousand. So uh, it has worked really well as good as a vaccine. And uh, I would say absolutely non inferior to even the randomization app also. So the experience was good. But because of the compounding issues and uh, being a private setup where you know, the patient flow may not be very high. So unfortunately, you know, we cannot uh, uh, say, remove everything and put it like a big inflation thing. So, you know, uh, that was one of the limitations. So that is why I have practically, practically switched to either giving it or uh, IBM. Yes, I can add on uh, Nishikant on that, what to your question is, because what we look at it and when we were pricing, we look at uh, like a number of allocates in a, per while in Avastin and Though there are people using making 20 injections, 25 injections, but on an average, it was somewhere between 8 to 10. We were just priced at it somewhere 4 or 5. When you look at 8 to 10 on an average, and then you look at a price, it's somewhere around that 5,000, which few feel reasonable. And if Kazumap can be priced at that rate, probably you totally get away with the Avastin. The Avastin. issue like Institute for us, what we have always is between a lot of free patients. And if you have a huge number of free patients, you still have to continue using Avastin because you just cannot afford that price as well. Okay, so I think that is what somewhere that 5,000 figure come up, uh, what I feel. Oh, very true. I think, I think the number of uh, Razumap is going up drastically and we can request the company to come down with the prices. So that I, I will increase the accessibility. Yeah, or maybe have a patient support program uh, like the other one. So, you know, if you yeah, yeah. indirectly bring down the price. So, anyway, I think we are reaching the uh, end of the time for this particular session. It has been a fantastic session. Uh, we know biosimilars are very much here to stay, and they have one, uh, done a wonderful job for us in India. And I'm sure with the patents expiring in US and in Europe, you're going to see an array of biosimilars coming in in ophthalmology. So, sir, just your closing remarks before yeah, I mean, we... I, I think all the presentations are exceptionally good. I think it's a top-class presentation, really happy. And I think we have a, some lively discussion. And with the take-home message is, yes, biosimilars are going to stay. I think they are future, not only for ophthalmology, I think for other specialty as well. And definitely it will reduce the burden on our health system, particularly have a limited budget, particularly in the Indian scenario. Thank you very much for all of you and everybody kept in fact, everybody finished before time. I think excellent session. Thank you. Looking forward to continue. Thank Thanks. Thanks for in task as well. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.